Turn in your Bibles to the book of Jude in the New Testament, all the way in the back before the book of Revelation. We're in Jude, and we've been going starting in verse number one today, and we're going to be in verse number eight. Is there anybody that needs a Bible? You don't have one? We've got Pastor Gibson is going to be handing those out. Just slip your hand up, and Pastor will come from the back. And uh, let's see, can I get one more person to help? Uh, Pastor Gibson, maybe Brother Rick, do you can you help him? Um, just keep your hands up, slip your hand up if you need a Bible, and uh, they'll get you those. So just a quick refresher. Jude, the half brother of Jesus, writes this letter to Jewish Christians. He identifies himself as the servant of Jesus and the brother of James, which is also the half brother of of Jesus and he uh, starts off by telling us who we are in Christ he says you guys are sanctified you're called out you're preserved and then he says I want uh, mercy and peace and love be multiplied onto you and then he starts to say I was going to write to you of the common salvation it was in his heart to write of the common salvation the gospel the good news that Jesus died in our place he was buried and he rose again for our salvation, for our forgiveness, for our eternal life. And then he says, you know what? I had a little bit of a different direction. It was needful for me that I write to you that you should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. And you see there was people that had crept in. The Bible says right there in verse number four, there were certain men crept in unawares, unnoticed. They slipped in unnoticed. And they were perverting the gospel. They were changing the grace of God into something that it was not meant to be. And the Bible says that they even got to a point where they denied the only Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says in verse number five, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Here Jude gives us three examples, and we talked about this last week. We talked about those who unbelieved, they were unbelieving in the wilderness, who were destroyed. We talked about the angels in verse 6, who kept not their first estate. They chose to follow Satan as he took a third of the angels with them, and they rebelled against God. And the Bible says that they're reserved in chains under darkness until the judgment of the great day. And then the third example was in verse 7 when he said, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. We talked about these three different examples of rebellion. Uh, they came in and they were not without punishment. They were not without judgment from God. And so Jude is trying to warn us he was warning them and he's warning us through this scripture and he's saying, look, you guys got to be on your toes. You've got to be to a point where you know the gospel, you know the truth, because I'm telling you right now, there's coming a time where people will sneak in unawares, unnoticed. They're going to start twisting scripture and changing it to mean something it didn't mean. And before you know it, you're off your guard and starting to go down a road of false doctrine and error to where you're eventually or those around you or the next generation is denying the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number eight, he says, Likewise, also, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignity. So he's tying these certain men that he's warning us against. He's tying them into the example in verse number seven and saying, Edom, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, um, they rejected the authority where it says in verse number eight, they despised dominion. They rejected authority. They are speaking evil of dignities. These are some people that came in that were trying to uh, kind of stir things up and, and get an influence into the church and get other people to reject authority. And we live in a culture today that definitely is pushing us to reject authority from our education system to the entertainment industry. We're constantly being pushed to reject authority. It's aimed at our kids. 
Um, it's aimed at adults. I was just looking this morning, and I'm going to read it to you straight off of this website. And this is something that our taxpayer dollars pay for with Planned Parenthood. It says, if you're under 18, you may or may not have to tell a parent in order to get an abortion. It all depends on the laws where you live. You're not alone. If you're pregnant and want to have an abortion, call your nearest Planned Parenthood health center as soon as possible. They can help explain the laws in your state, let you know what your options are, and give you tips on talking with your parents. It is important to take action right away. Abortion is very safe, but there are more risks the longer you wait. There are also time limits on abortion in some states, and if you need a judicial bypass, it can take a while to get through the process. Now they go right on their website, state by state by state. Alaska, no, parent, no parental involvement required. Arizona, your state requires that one of your parents give permission for your abortion. A judge can excuse you from this requirement. Um, Arkansas, your state requires that one of your parents give you permission for your abortion. A judge can excuse you from this requirement. California, no parental involvement required. Blah, 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 blah. You go down, no parental involvement required. No parental involvement required. Uh, Delaware, if you're under 16, your state requires that one of your parents, a grandparent, or a mental health professional be told of your decision 24 hours before your abortion. A judge can excuse you from this requirement. We live in a culture today that is saying you can reject authority. You can push it out. This is just one, one small example about the fact that we live in a culture that is pushing authority out. Pushing the parental authority out. You don't need to talk to your parents. This is a law, but a judge can help you bypass this. And gives uh, instructions on there how to do it. Last night, my daughter, Nalia, she's uh, hardcore into animals and gardening and stuff like that. And so um, on Pinterest, there's all kinds of different ideas for stuff like that. Well, this thing came up on Pinterest um about this wrapper not like a candy wrapper for, you, for you older generation but like a wrapper wrapper like uh, oh yeah you know what i'm talking about read that or listen to this while i read it uh his name is his rapper name anyway lil nas lil nas lil nas x however you want to say it lil nas x. is fully leaning into his new hellish aesthetic teaming up with an idea organize, organization to release satan shoes this on the heels of his polarizing music video on the same subject the rapper pop star is putting out a limited release of nike sneakers that are all about the prince of darkness and his kingdom right down to the box artwork and even the shoe design itself with feet which features a pentagram emblem sitting on the laces uh, you can see the photos in here. Look it up. This was this is like right now. The shoe body is a Nike Air Max 97, which the company behind this campaign has reinvented with Nasex new Montero song and video in mind. It's got a Bible scripture emblazoned on the side, right there, big old red letters, Luke 10:18, which uh, I believe says, um, as Satan as lightning fell from heaven. It, it references Satan's banishment from heaven. There's also a 666 reference towards the back of the shoe with another number in front of it alluding to which limited unit it is. Word is that they're only dishing out 666 of these pairs of shoes to the public. So if you have six with a slash 666, it basically means that you have the sixth edition of 666. Here's the kicker. Apparently these shoes will contain one drop of human blood somewhere along the soles. And no, not the metaphorical blood, sweat, and tears of the factory workers who will presumably put these together like actual blood. It's unclear whose blood exactly is being used for this, but it's provocative without a doubt. Of course, the collab follows Nas X dropping a visual project for his track Montero, Call Me By Your Name, which got a lot of mixed reactions this past week. 
It depicts him descending into hell and cozying up to Lucifer himself, giving him an erotic lap dance, no less. Some loved it, saying it's a celebration of his sexuality. Others, including some parents, only some parents, felt it was over the top, especially considering Nasek's younger audience, aka children, who came to know and love him through Old Town Road. I know that's familiar because you went into stores, you heard it on the radio, half of America was standing in front of a TV, um, take me back to the Old Town Road, and everybody's doing the little dance and everything, it's like cute, and, and this is the same guy. That was in 2019, this is right now. What I'm trying to say is that Jude was warning these Christians and saying these men are going to creep in unnoticed. They're going to come in and you guys are going to just be like, hey, what's up? They don't look any different. They don't talk any different right up front. So they're welcome, but they're not part of you. But they're going to influence you. And so you and I have to have our eyes open and say, what is the truth? What is the gospel? Because Jesus said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I don't change. And so we have to keep our eyes on the truth, even though we live in a day, just like in Judges 21, 25, when he said they had no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. The devil is coming hard after us and our kids. He comes in unnoticed at first until he doesn't. And then it's just right in your face. Verse number nine, the Bible says, Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuked thee. <clears throat> Michael, the archangel, faithful to God. Archangel means leading angel. He's mentioned four times in Scripture, Daniel chapter 10, Jan Daniel chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12, and here in Jude verse number 9. The devil rebelled against God. He's the enemies of man. But Michael and the other angels that stayed with the Lord are ministering spirits sent to help us. The devil's angels, demons, are demonic spirits who want to defeat us. Every time Michael, the archangel, is mentioned, it's mentioned in the context of battle. It's coming in the context of a readiness to fight. We know that Moses appeared on the Mount Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17 with Elijah, whose body was caught up in 2 Kings chapter 2. Now, Jude in this doesn't really say why. Michael the archangel was battling with uh, the devil over the body of Moses, but I think it's important uh, to say how he battled. It's a model of spiritual warfare. Jude is pointing out the fact that even Michael the archangel didn't take on the devil and, and everything in his own power and in his own strength. He said, the Lord rebuke you. He said, uh, you know what, I'm not going to uh, battle you and argue with you over the body of Moses um, for, for my reasons and in my strength, but I'm going to say the Lord rebuke you, someone that has more authority than me. And that is the model of spiritual warfare where Jews pointing out to this church, he's like, hey, these guys that, are, that have crept in unawares, the devil is using, they're unbelievers, don't, don't be fooled. And remember the children that, had, that were unbelieving in the wilderness and how they were destroyed. Remember the angels that fell and how they're reserved to judgment for the last day. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah and how they were destroyed. The wickedness that was in that city. Verse number 7 talks about the fact that they didn't just suffer uh, uh, hellfire right then and there when they were destroyed, but eternal fire. And then he's pointing out to them, hey, don't battle... Uh, don't battle this demonic influence in your own strength like Mark Angel, or like uh, Michael the archangel, but say the Lord rebuke you in the, in the Lord's name. Verse number 10, these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know, <clears throat> but what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things they corrupt 
themselves. Oh, that was last week. You guys don't want to hear that again, do you? Yeah, I do. Well, you weren't here, that's why. It's on YouTube. All right, verse number 10. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. In contrast to Michael, who didn't speak evil of the devil, these certain men spoke evil about things they didn't even know the truth about. They pretended to be spiritual, but their knowledge was natural. It's crazy how, how these guys that had crept in unawares were trying to act like they knew what they were talking about. Maybe loud, maybe, maybe saying like, well, this is the truth. And they were changing the grace of God into something it wasn't meant to be. And people started to listen and believe him. Remember last week we said, like uh, Hitler said, if you say something long enough and loud enough, eventually people will believe it. And so these guys were getting a little bit of a following, but they didn't even know what they were talking about. Um, the Bible says right there in verse number 10, but what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things, they corrupt themselves. Someone said this, how ironical that when men should claim to be knowledgeable, they should actually be ignorant. When they think themselves superior to the common man, they should actually be on the same level as animals and be corrupted by the very practices in which they seek liberty and self-expression. Um, they had an, instinct, an instinctive understanding, but without spiritual knowledge. And so Jude is warning us against people that can talk eloquent, can get a little bit of a following, but they're not telling us the truth. We talked last week how important it is to know and understand the scripture. Because that is the truth. Um, John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Look at verse number 11. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. He's pointing out the fact that these certain men have gone. Again, he gives us three examples. And he's saying these certain men that have come in unnoticed, that are unbelievers, they've changed the grace of God. They have denied the only Lord Jesus Christ. He says they're like these three people. And he starts off with Cain. Now you guys can turn there. Um, Genesis chapter number 4. In your Bibles, go back all the way to the beginning, Genesis chapter number four. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I know most of you know this story. But Genesis chapter four, he says, Woe unto them because they have gone in the way of Cain. In Genesis chapter number four, um, let's go down to. Uh, let's see, verse, let's just start in verse number one. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived, bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought the fruit of the ground and offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. So he murdered his brother. In verse 9, And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hands. So Cain and Abel both brought an offering to the Lord. Abel's offering was accepted and Cain's was not. 
Cain came to a place where he was talking with his brother and they got into an altercation and he ends up killing his brother. The first murder in God's word. And God comes to Cain and he says, hey, where's your brother? He's like, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? From that day forward, Cain was cursed. But if you go all the way into the New Testament, turn to Hebrews 11, chapter, or Hebrews chapter 11, and let's look at verse number 4. Hebrews chapter number 11 and verse number 4, the Bible says this, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. So you see, while there is some truth to the fact that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins, and Abel offered a blood sacrifice, an innocent lamb, where Cain brought a, a basket of fruit uh, uh, from his hard work, the ultimate uh, thing was that God said Abel offered his sacrifice to God by faith. And so you have Cain who represents unbelief. Cain brought something that was based on his works, not based on faith. And so when he says in verse number 11, or, or yeah, in verse number 11 in Jude, he says, Woe unto them, they're of the way of Cain. You have unbelief, these certain men. Then the second example he gives is the heir of Balaam. Would you guys turn to Numbers chapter 22, Old Testament? Numbers chapter number 22. He gives these three examples and he's saying, first, the way of Cain. Second, the heir of Balaam. Now, how many of us, don't answer this question, but how many of us, when we read these, when we read these uh, stories right here, these examples, the way of Cain, the error of Balaam, the rebellion of Korah, when we read those, how many of us already know the story in our mind? We should, we should know it, but it's a, a testament, I think, to Jude, as when he's talking to these guys, he's assuming that they know the story already. And it's, an, it's a challenge to us to say like, hey, if we don't know these stories, we need to spend a little bit more time in God's word, familiarizing ourselves with these stories that when a, when a pastor gets up and says, man, they went the way of Cain in your mind. Oh man, that's the guy that, that killed his brother. He didn't come to God by faith like his brother. The heir of Baal. Oh man, I, that, wasn't there a donkey in that story that talked? Yeah, I remember that story. So we, we familiarize ourselves with these stories. Look at number chapter number 22. Um, it says in verse number 2, And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was sore afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us, as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. He sent messengers, therefore, unto Balaam, the son of Beor, to Pithor, which is by the river of, river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt, Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail, that we may smite them, and that I may drive them out of the land. For I wot that he whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand, and they came unto Balaam and spake unto him the words of Balak. So listen, King Balak, he sends messengers, he sends money, he sends riches to this prophet, Balaam, and his plan is to entice him and say, hey, I'm going to pay you all this money. I just want you to come. I want you to curse Israel. There are a lot of people. I want them out of my way. They're, they're going to ruin my agenda. So if you'll just come, whoever you bless is blessed. Whoever you curse is cursed. So here, here's a huge chunk of money. I'm going to entice you to come and curse this people Israel. 
And the Bible says that they came to him in verse 7 and then verse 8. He said unto them, Lodge here this night, and I will bring you word again, as the Lord shall speak unto me. And the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. And God came to Balaam and said, What men are these with thee? And Balaam said unto God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, hath sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt, which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, curse me then, peradventure, I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. Verse 12, God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. For sake of time, God gives Balaam a direct answer to his question. No, don't go. Well, long story short, he gives him that answer and he says, Hey, I told you I can't say anything but what God tells me. So the answer is no, I can't, I can't curse them. They're blessed. The messengers go back to the king. The king is not, he's not going to take no for an answer. So he ups the ante. He's got more riches, more treasures. And he sends them back to Balak and he, or Balaam. And he says to them again, Hey, just come with us. Uh, just come check it out. Curse these people. You're going to be uh, lifted up. You're going to be promoted. You're going to have all these riches. And uh, look down at verse number, um, let's see, verse number 20. And God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, uh, if, men, if the men come to call thee, rise up and go with him. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, thou shalt do. And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. Now, we save a little, bit, a little bit of time, but God said, no, you're not going to curse these people. No, you're not going to curse these people. He asked God again, can I curse these people? He's like, okay, tell you what, if they come again, rise up, go with them. Verse number 22, God's anger was kindled because he went. How many times does God give us an answer in his word and we ask him again? Uh, are you sure I can't do this? God's like, no. Yeah. Uh, God, I know, like, if I could just do this. God's like, no. God, if I could, could I do this? And God's like, go ahead. Sure. And that's what he did right here with Balaam. So Balaam gets up, he goes, and God was not pleased with it. The Bible says the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass, and his two servants were with him. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand. And the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field. And Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. But the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. When the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself into the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. And he smote her again. So here's Balaam on his donkey. God already told him, no, don't go. No, don't go. No, okay, go ahead, go. And so now God puts an angel in the path that Balaam can't see, but the donkey sees it. And he's in this path. There's a wall on his right, a wall on his left. The, the angel has a sword and Balaam can't see it, but the donkey sees it. And so he doesn't want to keep going. And Balaam's hitting this donkey. Whack! And the donkey's just like, ah. And, and he's trying to get it to go. And then he runs his foot into the wall. He crushes his foot. He hits the donkey again. Um, how many of you guys remember the donkeys that used to just be right here next door? I know Frank and Donna, you guys remember that? I grew up, that was Dwayne's donkeys out there. Listen, donkeys are super stubborn. I remember uh, Dwayne out there. Dwayne, if you ever watch this, um, don't hold it against me. But I remember a two by four. Dwayne had to use a two by four to get that donkey to move. We'll just put it that way. Here this donkey was like, I am not, I am not going this direction. Look what it says in verse number uh, uh, 26. The angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where it was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. When the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam and Balaam's anger was kindled and he smote the ass with a staff. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee, that thou hast smitten these th me these three times? And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would, there, I would there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill thee. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am not I thine ass upon thou 
has written ever since I was dying unto this day, was I ever want to do so unto thee? And he said, nay. So here he's having a conversation with this donkey and it's just hilarious because he's like, he told God no, he told God no. And God's like, go ahead. And then his donkey's running in him to the wall. He's running him here. And then the donkey like sits down and is just like, dude, there's a guy right here with the sword. And, and he hits it again. He's like, the donkey's like, why are you hitting me? Like, and he's like, because you're not, it's like, he's talking back to a donkey. I think is even funnier than the donkey talking to him. But the point is that Balaam's eyes were so blinded by what he wanted versus what God told him. He had the answer. We have the answer. And Judah is saying, look, you guys, there's people that are sneaking in unawares. They creep in. You think they have a cute little song. And then the next thing you know, they're putting human blood in the soles of your shoes. And he's saying, look, here's an example. They're going to be destroyed. Those that rebel and have unbelief in God, those that are unbelievers, their end is destruction. And he's saying, I want you to earnestly contend for the faith. Don't let people creep in and change it. Don't let the media or the government or any education system come in and say, well, let's water it down. Let's take this out to where it's not as offensive. Look, I don't even like preaching messages like this. It's just where we're at. I picked Jude because it was super short, hoping that my dad would be well enough to preach. And here I am. I'm just like, man, it's not fun, but it's the truth. And when you go through the Bible verse by verse by verse, you don't get to avoid the truth. You have to just come into it headstrong. And here Balaam was rebelling after prophet. You have the way of Cain was unbelief. You have Balaam who was going after greed. It says in uh, Jude verse 11, it says that they were greedily going after the heir of Balaam. That's who these people that crept in unaware. Long story short with Balaam, just to get to the point, he doesn't end up blessing or uh, cursing Israel. He does bless them, but he ends up saying this. You know what, King Balak, I can't curse these people. God won't let me. After a series of, well, let's go over here and build an altar and see if God will let you curse them. Well, let's go over here and see if God will let you curse them. The answer was no, no, no. And it always was no. And then Balak gets uh, some advice from Balaam and he says, I'll tell you what. You want God to curse these people? You get your uh, young women to go in and marry their young men. And you turn their hearts slowly. And you sneak in there and you, you turn them and you get them to worship false gods and false idols and God will eventually curse them. Yeah. You see, again, sneaking in unawares. Yes. It's just how the devil works. It's how he worked back in the beginning of Bible time and it's how he works now. So he says, Woe unto them, the way of Cain, the, they ran greedily after the heir of Balaam. And then he closes, or I'm going to close, verse number 11. He says, and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. Now, we don't have a lot of time, but um, the rebellion of Kor is found in number 16. You don't need to turn there, but write it down. And we're just going to sum it up with this story. Korah was a leader in Israel. He was a Levite. He wasn't of the line of Aaron. He wasn't a priest, but he was a leader nonetheless. He had a role that he was to play for the people in Israel. And he came to a place where he was rejecting the authority of Moses. The Bible even says he came in and was like, Oh, Moses, you guys are lifting yourself up above the people. You know, you don't have this authority. And he says, Okay, tell you what, uh, Moses, or Moses says, this is just the position that God has me and Why don't you bring incense? We'll offer it to the Lord and we'll see who, kind of like a Cain and Abel kind of a deal, we'll see who the Lord accepts. Well, Korah comes, they burn their incense and uh, God says to Moses, Moses, you better step away from Korah right now. You better back away from him 
because my judgment is about to fall down on court. Moses, with his face to the ground, backs up. And the Bible says, you read it in Numbers chapter 16, the Bible says the earth opened up and swallowed Korah, and they were destroyed with fire. He wasn't content with the position that God had given him. God told Moses to stand back, and everyone in Israel saw right there the judgment of the Lord on the rebellion of Korah. Cain was a farmer. Balaam was a prophet. Korah was a leader in Israel. All different walks of life. And yet, in all different walks of life, evil crept in a little bit at a time. Just real slow. So, Jude wrote this letter in A.D. 65, 66, 67, somewhere in there. Here we are, 2021. Uh, I like what Solomon said. There's nothing new under the sun. All is vanity. There's not a new message that can be preached. It's the same thing over and over and over. That's why in, in Jude, in verse number, I think, 5, he said, I'm going to remind you of this, even though you once knew this. And he talked to them about the Israelites and the fallen angels and Sodom and Gomorrah. So here we are in church, um, the last Sunday of the month, and we're being directed to understand and to think about the fact that we have an enemy. His end is already determined. And those of us that know the truth need to stand up and contend for it and fight for it. It doesn't mean that you go around with, you know, some crazy banner at work with, like, scripture. It, it doesn't mean you're weird. It means you let Christ live through you. It means when the opportunity comes for you to speak up against something that's wrong, you open your mouth and you let God take over, and He will. Amen. It means that we show our children, you know, as she brings me this thing on Pinterest. Oh man, look at this guy with these shoes. We have an opportunity to say, wow, this, check this out. This is the truth. This is their end. We love people. We speak the truth in love. And as people see Christ in us, and as Jude started the letter out with, you're sanctified, you're preserved, you're called. And then when he closes the letter, he sandwiches everything that we were talking about in the middle with the same thing. He starts with that and he ends with that. And he's like praising God to the only God who can present me faultless. Um, and we'll get there. That's a whole nother message. But remember, Christ is in you. He wants to live through you. And he wants you and I to earnestly contend for the faith. It's a stance of a fighter, of a wrestler, not someone who's just kicked back in the easy chair, like that kind of a, a mentality, like, oh yeah, you know, Christ will build this church. It is what it is. It, whoever's going to get saved is going to get saved. No, he really wants you to earnestly contend for the faith and know your Bible. Amen. Let's pray. Let's go ahead and stand if you would. Your heads bowed, your eyes closed. We're going to dismiss. I'm going to ask if grandma would uh, come and play. We're going to have uh, just a short invitation, a little bit of a different message today, but I'm going to, I'm going to pray. And as I close in prayer with heads bowed and eyes closed, grandma, I'm asking that you just play one, one verse. If you want to take time to kneel in your seat where you're at, come forward, get with someone and uh, just spend some time with the Lord. If you don't know that you're saved, uh, if you take this time to grab someone next to you and say, Hey, you know what? I don't know if I'm on my way to heaven. You come talk to me. I'll hook you up with someone, a lady or a, or a young man that would take you in a different room, not embarrass you, but show you from God's word how you can know that you're saved, that you're forgiven, that you're on your way to heaven. Father in heaven, I love you. I thank you that you loved us first. Thank you that you died in our place on a cross so that we could be forgiven. Thank you that it's not based on our works, God, but it's based on faith in you alone. We repent and we receive it by faith. God, if there's anyone in here that doesn't know you as their Savior, I pray that today would be the day they come forward. They say, Justin, I don't know if I'm saved, but I want to know. Mm -hmm. If there's anybody in here today, Lord, that you've challenged their heart in a way that I didn't even mention, 
but you're working in their heart, I pray that they would just yield to you and surrender that area of their life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As the music begins to play, it's going to be short, short invitation. If you want to come forward, you want to kneel in your seat, if you don't know if you're saved, don't, don't hesitate to come and just say, Justin, you know what? I need to know for sure that I'm on my way to heaven and I'll hook you up with someone that will take you back to a private room and open up God's word and show you how you can be saved.